What if you could have a career where the opportunities are as vast as our nation, where it's not about mission statements, but a shared mission? At U.S. Customs and Border Protection, we go beyond to protect more than borders, from ship to shore, air to ground, cities to local communities. CBP agents and officers are keeping people safe. Join U.S. Customs and Border Protection and go beyond for something far greater than yourself. Learn more at cbp.gov careers. Hi, this is Scott. If you're a fan of the ancient world, please help us get the word out. Like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, and rate the series on iTunes. Thanks again for listening. The Ancient World Bloodline Episode B46, Melek Melek Whether 8 or 18 when he was taken, his next 37 years were spent in captivity. In an alien capital, his people considered the epitome of vice and corruption. His name was Jeconiah, son of Jehoiakim, and his seizure by King Nebuchadnezzar II was the start of the Babylonian captivity. Judah was drawing its final breaths, and the changeable figure elevated in his place, Jeconiah's twenty-year-old uncle Zedekiah, would hold the distinction of being its very last king. Thirty-seven years of Babylonian exile before Nebuchadnezzar finally died, and his son Amel Marduk ascended the throne. In an effort to step out from his father's long shadow, Amel Marduk quickly set himself to overturning his father's policies, the most notable of which was releasing and pardoning the captive King Jeconiah. By the time Amel Marduk was assassinated, only two years later, Babylon had started its own rapid decline. But the seeds of his clemency bore unusual fruit. The local Jewish community, those who'd fled Jerusalem's destruction, still considered Jeconiah their legitimate ruler, and he'd go on to lead them in the novel role of exile arc. The exiled Jews erected a new synagogue using stones and earth from Jerusalem. The location they chose was a city at the junction of the Euphrates and the King's Canal called Nehardea. Centuries later, Josephus described the city as both thickly populated and impregnable, as it is surrounded by the Euphrates and is strongly fortified. Over the centuries that followed, Nehardea remained a center of Babylonian Judaism, with its Talmudic school serving as host to a string of Jewish luminaries. In the summer of 262 AD, the forces of the Roman ducks Septimius Odenathus captured and destroyed Nehardea. Ever since the days of Cyrus the Great, the Jews had been seen as allies of the Persians, and, true or not, Odenathus didn't want to leave a potential enemy at his back. After recovering the cities of Cari and Nisibis, he descended deep into Sassanid territory and was now in effective striking distance of Tessaphon. For what it's worth, the Historia Augusta put some meat on the campaign's bones. It claims that Odenathus besieged an army of Persians at Tessaphon, and devastated all the country round about, killing men without number. But when all the satraps from all the outlying regions flocked together to Tessaphon for the purpose of common defense, there were long-lasting battles with varying results. But more long-lasting still was the success of the Romans. It also records that Odenathus showed no lack of respect toward Gallienus, for he sent him the satraps he captured. As I mentioned a while back when Gordian tried it, the last Roman emperor to lay siege to Tessaphon was Septimius Severus way back in 198. Doing so now put Odenathus in a very select company of Roman commanders, including Severus, Trajan, and Avidius Cassius, 
all of whom had enjoyed the luxury of a unified empire at their back. In the end, Tessaphon was too well defended for Odenathus to capture the city. The Dux Orientis broke his siege, and, much like Shapur in recent years, he took the gold and slaves he'd already captured and crossed back over the Euphrates. The captives Odenathus sent to Rome were gratefully received by Gallienus. The emperor just put down another revolt, this time in Egypt by the prefect Aemilianus, and was likely delighted that somehow, somewhere, something was actually going well. He decided to showcase the Persian prisoners in a good old-fashioned Roman triumph, where he'd piggyback on Odenathus' success and take the title Persicus Maximus. Now, there was one somewhat sticky issue that Gallienus had to address— Caught up in the flush of Odenathus's victory, his troops had hailed him as Imperator, though apparently in the style of victorious commander rather than potential usurper. Odenathus hadn't accepted the title, but then he hadn't not accepted it either. Accepting it openly, like Samsi Garamus, might have earned Odenathus a similar fate but leaving it up to the emperor's discretion probably seemed much less threatening. Recognizing his limited options, Gallienus let it slide. In most every respect, Odenathus's campaign of 262 was a major, major success. True, the city of Tessaphon had managed to hold out, killing any hopes of moving further east to rescue the captive Valerian, but Shapur and the Sassanids were on the defensive, the Palmyrene frontier was more secure, and Mesopotamia and Osirini were back in Roman hands. On a personal level, the insult that Shapur had given Odenathus had pretty clearly been repaid in full. Well, maybe except for one last twist of the knife. Toward the end of the next year, 263, Odenathus took a new title. Just to confirm what was already obvious, he named himself King of Palmyra. But as long as he was doing that, Odenathus went one step further. What did he do? Well, he took the title of Melek Melek, Aramaic for a King of Kings. And I swear, I laughed out loud the first time I read this, because, seriously, that is perfect. I mean, Gallienus had zero interest in how Odenathus styled himself. The only titles that meant anything were those conferred by Rome. But Shapur? Oh my god, Shapur must have hit the roof. Especially with that really tall globe crown he wore. I mean, seriously, watch your clearance. No, King of Kings was mainly intended for an audience of one. A triumphant middle finger to King Shapur and the whole Sassanid Empire. Odenathus soon elevated his elder son, 12-year-old Hiron, to co-King of Kings, and his wife Zenobia to Queen. There's a lead token associated with Hiron that shows him wearing a conical crown which may be the one used by him and Odenathus. Hiron's coronation was held in Antioch, and seemed to imply that whatever it was the Ducks was building, he intended for it to last. And it's safe to say that, based on everything he'd achieved so far, he certainly had the backing of the ancient sources. According to the Historia Augusta, had not Odenathus, prince of the Palmyrenes, seized the imperial power after the capture of Valerian, when the strength of the Roman state was exhausted, all would have been lost in the east. It also adds that while Valerian was growing old in Persia, Odenathus the Palmyrene gathered together an army and restored the Roman power almost to its pristine condition. Writing around two centuries later, the Greek scholar Labanius praised Odenathus, 
the mention of whose name alone caused the hearts of the Persians to falter. Everywhere victorious, he liberated the cities and the territories belonging to each of them, and made enemies place their salvation in their prayers rather than in the force of arms. And then there's our disturbed friend muttering to himself in the corner, also known as the 13th Sibylline Oracle. Then will come, sent from the sun, a lion, terrible and frightful, breathing a great flame. Then indeed he will destroy, with much shameless daring, the stag, well-horned and swift, and the greatest beast, the frightful venomous one, that issues many hissing noises, and the goat that goes sideways. Him will glory attend." He himself, unblemished and great, will rule over the Romans, and the Persians will be powerless. And yeah, sorry, but the goat that goes sideways, that's you, Shapur. Yeah, I know, it's pretty harsh. Speaking of ruling over the Romans, what did Odenathus actually rule? Well, King of Kings or King of Palmyra got him pretty much the same thing. Client King status over a swath of desert between the Euphrates, Emissa, and Arabia Petraea. The maximum interpretation of his Roman titles gave him quite a bit more real estate. Running from the Taurus Mountains to the Red Sea and from the Euphrates to the Mediterranean. It also included a formidable tally of at least half a dozen Roman legions. True, he controlled it in the name of the emperor, but it's also true that, most of the time, Gallienus was otherwise occupied. The whole Roman West, Gaul, Germania, Raetia, Britannia, and Hispania, was in open revolt against imperial authority. In the east, he wanted the border secure and taxes to flow and any pesky revolts to be put down. But as long as Odenathus stayed loyal to Rome, he could pretty much do what he wanted. As mentioned before, Odenathus's court was likely based in Emesa, though he probably rotated between there, Palmyra, and the restored metropolis of Antioch. In terms of his administration, we're mainly left in the dark. The only figure we know by name is a senior official named Verodes. Judging by his name, Verodes may have been ethnically Parthian. Though, whether he'd spent his whole life in Palmyra or come as a refugee fleeing the Sassanids is impossible to know. But either way, he eventually rose to be Odenathus' right-hand man. His long list of titles include Procurator, Symposiarch, Strategos, and Argopates, a variation of the Parthian Hargbed or Persian Argbod, meaning castle ruler. Historian Pat Southern says this last title probably indicated a high command embracing both civil and military control of Palmyra. It suggested that Verodes acted as deputy for Odenathus and controlled the state when he was away. According to historian Richard Stoneman, Verodes received a total of eight honorific statues along the Grand Colonnade, a number unequaled by any other Palmyrene. The fullest dedication records that the Council of the People honors Septimius Verodes, the mighty steward of Augustus, with the rank of Ducenarius, lawgiver of the mother country, who escorted the caravans at his own expense and was commemorated by the chief merchants, who led the troops magnificently. When it comes to Odenathus's rule, two more things are worth noting. The first is that Odenathus studiously avoided the most glaring mistake of Samsigarimus. He never minted coins bearing his own image. Which sucks for coin collectors like me, but was otherwise a pretty smart move. The second thing is, after 264, the Palmyrene Council stopped electing their own magistrates. 
According to Southern, this likely marked the final step from oligarchy to monarchy. The next few years are a veritable dark age in terms of Palmyrene history. No Persian inscriptions, no chatty Greek scholars, not even a good Sibylline oracle. Whether Shapur was sulking, building cities, or warring out east, he never came back across the Tigris. Out west, Gallienus was taking a stab at trying to recover his breakaway provinces. But after two campaigns, he only managed to reclaim Raetia. Meanwhile, Odenathus, as far as we know, continued to rule wisely and well. And that's pretty much all we have until 266. Sometime that year, Odenathus launched a second campaign against Persia. This time around, his motivations are a little bit harder to nail down. Maybe Shapur's lack of aggression was read by the ducks as military weakness, or maybe he wanted to reverse the charges and use Persia to top up his treasury. Which actually brings up a pretty good point. The ducks was responsible for defending the frontier, which meant raising and equipping a sizable army, taking care of their day-to-day -day needs, and maintaining a number of military installations in the desert and along the Euphrates. The hefty bill for most of this came directly to Odenathus. I also mentioned Palmyrene trade was suffering a slow decline, which meant Odenathus was forced to do more with less. With the lack of available help from Rome, the Dux was probably racking his brain to find new sources of income. The preferred option was increased trade, but the Persians had put the kibosh on that by dismantling Palmyrene trade colonies. So attacking the Sassanids likely had two goals, weakening their hold on regional trade and compensating for lost earnings with a bit of Persian plunder. Sometime in the spring of 267, Odenathus was back at Tessaphon, and however things were going this time, the fates decided to intervene and word arrived of a Scythian invasion along the Black Sea coast. The invaders in question were called the Heruli, an East German tribe from far to the north, who'd crossed the Black Sea in a fleet of ships and were ravaging Bithynia Pontus. Which, okay, well, that sucks, but what did it have to do with Odenathus? I mean, the maximum interpretation of the Ducks' authority ended south of the Taurus Mountains. Well, the most likely scenario was Gallienus was busy, and the invasion was considered threatening enough to merit a major response. Whatever the reason, Odenathus broke his siege of Tessaphon and prepared to march north for Anatolia. Now, Babylonia to the Black Sea coast isn't exactly an afternoon jog, and it may have taken several weeks before his army completed the journey. In fact, by the time Odenathus arrived, the Heruli captured Heraclea Pontica, loaded the plunder onto their ships, and were preparing to set sail for home. But before they were able to get too far, the Historia Augusta notes that many were lost by shipwreck or defeated in a naval engagement. One possibly led, or at least dispatched, by Odenathus. Once the coast was clear of pirates, Odenathus returned to Emesa. And I mean, seriously, he'd earned some downtime after leading two separate military actions about 1,200 miles apart. A short time later, the Ducks was celebrating the birthday of a friend when, according to Zosimus, he was treacherously slain by his cousin, and with him, his son Hieron, whom he had also hailed as emperor. The Historia Augusta names the assassin as a Palmyrene noble named Maonius whose motivation is given as contemptible envy. 
According to historian Pat Southern, a more likely theory is that the Palmyrene leader was killed by Palmyrenes who were discontented with the political developments in their city. Though the Palmyrene Senate and people survived at least until 266, when they dedicated a statue to Verodes, their power and influence had probably been curtailed by the King of Kings. So, maybe Maonius, like Brutus and Cassius, thought he was striking some principled blow against the encroachment of Palmyrene tyranny. But I tend to think the real explanation was something a bit more sinister. You may recall another local ruler who was killed by a royal relative. Khosrov II, the king of Armenia, who was slain by a noble named Anak. On that occasion, it was pretty easy to point the finger at King Shapur, especially since the Sassanids had followed up with the invasion and conquest of Armenia. Threatened by back-to-back -back sieges of Tessaphon, and with Odinothus's star on the rise, it's certainly possible the Shahan Shah had gone back to the same poisoned well. Maybe he'd promised the noble Maonius better relations, enhanced trade privileges, and other more direct rewards if he overthrew his troublesome cousin and took the throne for himself. Whatever the reason, the result was the same. Septimius Odenathus, Dux Orientis, and King of Kings, was killed in the city of Emesa in 267. The Historia Augusta says Maonius was saluted as emperor through some blunder, but was shortly thereafter killed by the soldiers, who handed the government to Zenobia. Her claim to the Palmyrene throne was pretty clear to everyone. But apart from that, things quickly got more complicated. The titles that gave her husband real power, Dux Orientis and Imperator, had been granted by Gallienus to Odenathus alone. They weren't transferable, they weren't inheritable, and by clear interpretation of Roman law, they expired upon his death. So, with hardly a moment to spare for grief, Zenobia had to decide. Accept a severely diminished role as a minor Roman client queen, or try to preserve what her husband had built using every means at her disposal. It probably comes as no surprise that Zenobia chose the latter, Though whether to honor her husband, protect her family, satisfy her own ambitions, or a bit of all three is pretty much anyone's guess. But once she decided, her first step was obvious. She needed the support of the army. As historian Pat Southern notes, Zenobia was probably well known to the troops, especially if she'd accompanied Odenathus on campaign sharing hardships and demonstrating courage. He also suggests that two Palmyrene generals, Septimius Zabai and Septimius Zabdus, may have played a critical role in rallying the army to her side. Zenobia's other major asset was her nine-year-old son, Vabalathus, who quickly assumed the title of King of Kings. If she wanted to hold power in a Roman world, doing so through a suitable male figure was a tried and tested approach. I mean, call it coincidence or call it fate, but she was sitting in the city of Emesa, home to three formidable women who'd exercised power through young male heirs. And if their example showed a possible path, their mistakes were a cautionary tale one that Queen Zenobia would work very hard to avoid.